Hey, 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 tomorrow. Welcome to Orbit 12.07. I'm Jade Kim. I have here a Jared Head. And today we are super excited to be interviewing Dr. Tamitha Scove, aka the Space Weather Woman. We are just going to go ahead and dive right into it. Um, so, Dr. Tamitha Scove, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure you're plenty busy with all of the amazing projects you have going on. Um, so, to start off thank the interview, you. I just want to ask, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. It's just another sunny day in space, and uh, weather couldn't be better. Nice. <laughs> um, so speaking of weather and space and sunny, um, so do you think you can kind of explain a little bit about what you do in terms of being a space weather woman? Because we're all familiar with um, weather people, um, but what you do is a little bit different. Well, actually, I'm, that's one of the things I'm trying to fix. Uh, oh. I am actually trying to make it so that it isn't different. Uh, space weather has always been considered some like an academic uh, science, and that's really not what I want people to look at space weather as. As a matter of fact, I, I'm sure there's lots of fans of Neil deGrasse Tyson, and if you go to his star talk and he talks about space weather, he says, when I think of space weather, I think of weather on other planets. And it's like, mm. no, Neil, that's <laughs> not what we're talking about. Stop it, Neil. So if you, if you yeah, stop it, bad boy. So if, if you you know, already know that space weather is something radically different than that, then to some degree, you've got a leg up on Neil. Yes. But that, that, kind of, <laughs> that kind of points out some of the issues that we have with space weather, is that even a lot of people in our own field, uh, I mean, I'm not an astrophysicist, but uh, there, I, I do work in space, you know, from that point of view, and it's a very similar field. And yet there are so many people that really don't even understand what space weather really means uh, as a working science. And so I'm really trying to change that. And, and really the, the path through that is not through academia. It ends up being more through meteorology and getting the weather people to understand that, hey, you know, space is pretty much, it's like your own backyard, but it's just a little further up. And so that's what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is trying to, well, at least anymore, as the space weather woman, mm. I try to put those pieces together and get people to realize that space weather is a lot different than what they would think it would be, and it's a lot more accessible. Um, and it also affects us in more and more ways every single day. Mm -hmm. So uh, just give us a little bit of your background, uh, sort of like where you got started and kind of like how do you, how do you specifically get interested and focused on studying the sun? Because that's, heliophysics is like a really specific kind of physics that you can do. Yes, thank you. Uh, Actually, the whole thing, and I may not be the right person to ask regarding this because my route was very circuitous. You know, I was watching uh, one of your interviews the other day. You did Joe Bernard from, what was it, BPS Space, I think. And he was talking about how he, he kind of did it backwards. He, he got a music degree, right, and then realized, oh, wait a minute. I want to do engineering. I want to go into to space and, and, and build rockets. And I kind of like the flip side of that coin because what happened with me was that I, I was an artist and uh, it always played, played music and things like that. But I decided to go into space and, and get an engineering, well, not really an engineering, a science degree, and, uh, but study engineering in science and in particularly space. But I found that some of the subject matter was so painfully dry that I ended up using my art to, in a sense, keep me sane all through grad school. So what, what ended up happening for me is that even though I was an artist and I'd read a lot of sci-fi books and a lot of sci-fi novels and, um, you know, David Brin and Isaac Asimov, Dan <laughs> Simmons, Philip K. Dick, I mean, I could go on forever of, of all the, the really cool sci-fi novelists out there. Um, but when I started studying the actual science and the, the physics, I became enraptured by how clever these physicists were and how the, the truth really became stranger than fiction because you could take something completely insane, a system that just seemed totally chaotic and suddenly flip it on its head just by changing your coordinate system. And you found, you know, symmetries and all sorts of other things that allowed you to suddenly make sense of this really chaotic world. And I thought, if wow, physicists can do that, then, um, you know, we've, we've, it, it's, it's a totally different 
realm than where these these sci-fi art, you know, these sci-fi novelists and things could go. So that's what got me into actually doing um, and studying physics. But again, because I was I had that artist side of me, it it became really difficult to to maintain the focus and discipline, and I had to have an outlet. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I had an a, a audio recording studio and I had played in a band and I did records for people and we did live webcasts and all sorts of things over the course of my entire graduate career. And I even toured with, with a band um, for uh, you know several years. And uh, it almost prevented me from finishing grad school as a matter of fact. But oh, wow. uh, in the end, <laughs> I know, weird, huh? Um, but in the end, what, in, what I ended up um, what it ended ultimately doing is saving me from from either flunking out or just kind of going down the path of of being just another scientist, just another ordinary um, you know engineer kind of thing. It allowed me to keep that artistry in and look at the sun in all its beauty and wonder, um, if you can see it behind me, um, in in a in a way that an artist still looks at the sun. And so, how I grew up into what I do, um, it really came more from an artist's perspective, believe it or not, than from a physics one. Wow. And uh, to kind of talk about art uh, with that, uh, Carrie Ann in our chat room is asking, how would you say that art has influenced what you do today? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Space Weather Woman wouldn't be me. I, I, it, it wouldn't exist if it weren't for art. Uh, you know, there's a whole field called astrosociology. Hmm. And if you've never heard of it, it's it's um, it's fascinating, and it it really goes into the history of of how space has influenced our popular culture, hmm. and you see that no more uh, keenly than you see it in art. As a matter of fact, we talk about Elon Musk all the time, so I'll I'll just mention a classic one. Even <laughs> Elon is incredibly influenced by astrosociology and and the pop icons that go with it. I mean, look who he launched in space, right? Mm -hmm. Starman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that came from? <laughs> right, you're talking about one of the most influential and one of the one of the earliest uh, astrosociologists of all time. Most people think David Bowie's just a musician, a British rock musician, but in actuality, he was an he was a pioneer for astrosociology. Oh, that's so and uh, <laughs> and 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 to this day, he he remains an incredible inspiration to me. Um, not that necessarily he knew what he was doing. <laughs> I think at the time he just thought it was really cool. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, you know, he's a huge ambassador for space. And, and Elon taking up that mantle and launching Starman into space and Chris Hatfield, look at the first and I think only recording of, of a song in space. Whose mm -hmm. was it? Exactly. Right? Yep. Major Tom's, right? So people have a tendency to kind of not realize that, that artists' legacies extend far beyond what they they themselves may have originally intended. Uh, in the case of, of Bowie, his legacy is is as much space related as it is music and fashion. So I I have a tendency to look at things kind of that way you know, in kind of an orthogonal way. So I kind of wanted to uh, go to the chat room real quick because we have some really good questions from folks in our chat room. Uh, one from Jazz Throughout is actually asking uh, sort of what is the source of the material for your space weather reports? Kind of like respectively, where is it available online? Oh my gosh, there's tons of places that are available online. I can even walk through some of them if you'd like. Everything I use in the space weather reports are, are either available at the Space Weather Prediction Center from NOAA or they're available from NASA directly, um, or they're available you know, from multiple places in NASA, or available at Lockheed Martin, for example, because they're where uh, the SDO instrument is, or the SDO spacecraft is with the AIA instrument, which is the one that I mainly use, that have the really beautiful pictures of the sun. Um, and then the, the, only diff the only thing that is not available that I actually create on my own are my five-day outlooks because that's part of what I do uh, where I'm trying to normalize space weather and turn it into something that is more like terrestrial weather. So people can, you know, again, they feel, um, they feel connected to it. They feel, it, it feels very uh, instinctual uh, because they've seen it every day on the, on the you know, five o'clock news and having space weather presented in that format makes it easier for them. 
And uh, kind of get another question too uh, from Frida in our chat room uh, asking, uh, I love the delivery and pace you use for space weather on your channel. What kinds of decisions did you make when thinking of the best ways to deliver this information to the general public, i.e., did you go like dry technical versus visual graphics and other things like that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, that, you know, that's that's what's really funny is that, uh, again, I, I really just let the community lead me. And, oh, if you look at some of my early stuff, oh, please don't. I think, I think there's there's some stuff on uh, back from like 2013, 2014, where I'm talking way too fast or I'm getting way too technical uh, or I'm taking way too much time trying to explain, you know, the, the details, the minutia of the concepts that's that, you know, let's say there's a big eruption on the sun. And it, I just, I just got tons of feedback from people saying, what are you doing? And I think this is cool, but I just don't get it. And so really it's been kind of a, a molding over time. It's been a, a massage of, of figuring out what type of either metaphors or, or just general concepts that I can deliver that make intuitive sense to people without you know, making them feel like they're drinking from a fire hose. And uh, it, that's, it's not necessarily something that, that was easy to come up with, and it took a lot of time. And as you can see, even with the tomorrow forecasts, when I'm doing these, the Geo Leo or the, the Leo Mio Geo orbit outlook, oh man, you should hear my delivery. I'm, I'm like very nervous when I'm actually giving those. And, and I've had some people already tell me, slow down. And the reason why my delivery is so fast on those is simply because I'm nervous. You know, it may look like I'm smooth and polished and all that stuff, but when it comes to trying to deliver new segments and trying out new things, oh yeah, I'm nervous as all get out. Uh, because I'm still in the back of my mind thinking, okay, is this gonna work? Is this clear enough? You know, what do I need to do to, you know, I end up stopping half the time uh, when I'm shooting and and saying, no, no, you can't, you don't use electron. No, 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 don't use, oh, magnetopause. Oh God, why did you say that? You know, I, I, I will stop myself when I use, you know, four syllable words and say, no, 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 you got to find a, a simpler way of delivering this because it's the message that matters, not, not the intellectual, you know, tone of it. And uh, I got a two part question for you. First, uh, yeah. tell us your channel because I, <laughs> people probably want to know your channel and they should. And then the second part of that question is, uh, can we go over some space weather? Like, can we talk about sure. some space weather right now? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You want, uh, well, well, we'll do it in two parts. The first thing is my channel. Uh, I, I wish the channel were, were you know, ch uh, just you type in uh, the username would be Tama the Scope, but that's not it. You could do a search on, on YouTube to get Tama the Scope. But when I first started this stuff out, I actually started out on Twitter because Twitter is a much more news ready, you know, kind of soundbite type uh, format. And, and so I never intended to have a YouTube channel, to be honest. I intended to be on Twitter and then use YouTube as just kind of a backup for, for some of the stuff I was doing. So my user handle is SP, I think, I'm, I think it's SPWX, which is space weather, SPWX. FX, meaning space weather effects. So that's my actual user handle, and I've never changed it because I, well, people started coming to it, and now I'm kind of stuck with that with that name. So that is my that is my actual handle. But if you Google space weather woman, my gosh, I, I'm it's you'll find me on all sorts of social media, including YouTube. Uh, it's pretty easy to find me. Um, and then regarding the space weather, do you want to go over space weather right now, or do you want to go over some of the phenomena? So if you could just give us a little bit of background about space weather, sort of like the, the basics of it and some of the phenomena that are involved in it. Sure, I, I'd love to. Uh, so what I'll, what I'll first start with is this, uh, this diagram I've got up here and that you guys can probably switch to anytime you want. Um, it's basically, we're talking about the sun in, in all of its splendor. And this is one of the things that a lot of people seem to get very confused about when they look at some of these images that come out of, of NASA and NOAA. Um, they say, well, you know, you guys have all these different colors when you look at the sun. What, what in the world do all these different colors mean? And believe it or not, we scientists, we use all these different colors for a very specific reason. It's not just, you know, rainbows and lollipops that we're, we're, we just like all these kaleidoscopic colors all the time. 
there's actually a, a real set reason that we do it. And the main reason is because uh, we, if you look, think of the sun as like an onion, then there are all these different layers that the sun has. And believe it or not, all of these different images that you're looking at, that's all essentially the same moment in time. Doesn't, you'd never think that. But if you, if you look at the yellow sun all the way down on the, on the left, you see the sunspots. This is what you see with your eye. And that's what you see on the ground. You can see it's, it's essentially white light. But as we go up in temperature, things change. And you basically are looking at higher and higher uh, uh, layers in the, in the sun's atmosphere. And when you, when you get to, let's say, this, this layer right here, this is the chromospheric layer. This is 304 angstroms, as we call it. See this big loop right here? Mm -hmm. You can't see it pretty much in anything else, right? You mm -hmm. definitely don't see it from the ground. You don't see it here. This is where we see lightning. You can still see some of the some of the sunspot activity, but now you see plage, and this is where we actually see electrical uh, lightning going back and forth between the two different uh, these different regions. But here is where you actually see the start seeing the solar atmosphere, and this is where uh, the big solar storms originate. They all originate off of the surface of the sun and move outward into what we call the corona. And as you go higher and higher in energy, you see more of that tenuous atmosphere being blown off. And as we go continually higher and higher and higher, you can get into hotter and hotter energies. You start seeing things like the magnetic field moving out, um, and then even the hottest parts of the bright, what we call the bright active regions. So there's really, when I do a lot of the space weather stuff, and I show different colors of the sun, it's not just to be pretty pictures. There really are reasons for me showing that, because if I want to focus on a solar flare, or I want to focus on uh, what we call coronal mass ejections, these big solar storms that blow out, I need these different layers. I need to be able to focus in on them. So that in of itself begins to make it a little bit complicated. And, and that's why it's so difficult to understand space weather you know, just out of the drop of a hat. You have to have somebody explaining it a little bit to you in order for you, any of it to make any sense. But as we, as we use these colors now in the sun, we use them for very specific reasons. So like here is a solar flare, and I'll play this little movie for you. Hopefully you can see this. You'll see it and you'll know it when you see it. Ready? One, two, three, boom. Okay, so Yowza. that is a solar flare. Yeah, and that, that solar flare, that actually causes things like radio blackouts. Uh, and the reason for that is it often lets out this radio noise. You get, um, essentially the sun is screaming. It's screaming in all sorts of different kinds of light. It's screaming in X-rays and gamma rays, but it's also screaming in microwaves and radio waves. And of course, those are the waves we use to communicate. So when you get a big solar scream, which is a solar flare, uh, what happens is the sun will scream for hours. And when you have a, a satellite communications, well, that becomes a real problem because it's kind of like having a cricket near the train tracks. I always talk about it this way. You can hear the cricket, and the satellites are the cricket. They're chirping away, and you hear them just fine until the train goes by. And while the train's going by, now you can't hear the cricket. You can only hear the train. It doesn't mean the cricket isn't chirping. The cricket's chirping just fine. But you can't hear it until the train stops going by, until it's gone, and then you can hear the cricket again. And that's exactly what we have with satellite communications when we have a big solar flare. <clears throat> wow. Excuse and, me. And uh, Raj Luthera from our YouTube channel is asking, how easy is it to predict the weather of our sun? And can you predict the weather of other stars uh, other than yellow dwarf stars like our sun? Oh, my gosh, no. <laughs> we can't even <laughs> predict the weather on our own star. We are, we are basically where terrestrial weather was back in the 50s and 60s. Hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the late president of the AMS, the American Meteorological Society, he shared with me um, a, um, the, the analogy. He says, look, he says, Tamitha, I, I look at you and on space weather forecasting and broadcasting the way we looked at Harry Volkman, who was a Chicago weather reporter way back in the 50s and 60s. And he, I think he retired in the, in the 80s or something. And um, basically he would take tornado warnings, military weather forecasts, and he would present them on public television. And all they had back then were tornado sirens. Basically, is there a storm coming? Yes. Sound the alarm and everybody duck for cover. 
And that's really where we are when it comes to space weather is uh, we know these things happen when they're happening. And when we have something like a solar flare like this, it will then launch and I'll play this, this next movie here. It will then launch a solar storm oftentimes. They, they, now that you don't have to launch a solar storm. This is a CME right here during these solar flares, but you can, and they often do happen together. So when you see a big solar flare occur, and then you see a big solar uh, CME, a big solar storm occur, uh, and I'll pause this here in just a sec when this comes out just a little bit more, um, then you know you have about three or four days. Whoops, I lost my cursor here. Let me stop it. You have about three or four days before that thing reaches you. And what we're looking at here, we were looking at the surface of the sun. You saw that big magnetic loop. This is actually uh, a bunch of, it's like gas, but it's, it's called a plasma because it's charged gas. And so when you have a charged, you know, what we call an ionized gas, what ends up happening is that it now sees electric and magnetic fields. And so it's jailed by whatever the magnetic field is doing. And the magnetic field is in a loop in kind of like what I call a solar slinky. Uh, some, some scientists have actually called it solar slinkies. And so here's the sun <laughs> on this side of the picture. Here's the sun again. And now you're looking out into the atmosphere of the sun and you can actually see this solar slinky, see it? Mm -hmm. And that, that shape will, will continue all the way to Earth. It's, it's amazing how it does that. But the magnetic field literally jails it very much like a slinky, a real slinky. And we, we use these slinkies oftentimes to, to kind of try to figure out how these structures actually will impact Earth and cause trouble with our own magnetic shield. But the problem is, these, all of this stuff happens all the time, all at once. So people get confused between what is a solar flare and what is a solar storm. And you can get a radiation storm at the same time. So it all becomes this big amalgam of junk. And, and that's where confusion starts because people say, well, a solar flare just happened, but it's gonna take three days to hit us. How is that possible when all this stuff travels at the speed of light? And it's like, well, no, the screaming of the sun arrives in eight minutes at the speed of light, but the solar storm is much slower. And so it rives in three to five days. And that's what causes auroras, the solar storm, not the solar flare. It's, it can be very complicated. Wow. Yeah, well, it looks like you already answered a question that was in our chat from uh, Twitch, actually. Hanny Zvorwerp had asked, how long does it take for an event on the sun to affect us on Earth? Hours, comma, days? Um, but you actually cleverly answered that just now. But there's another interesting question posed in the chat, and I think you would appreciate this. Prodigal Sun asks, um, you mentioned that there were tornado sirens. Do you think that in the future we will ever have solar storm sirens? Uh, and you're not talking the singing kind. Uh, you're talking an actual, like a tornado siren. Well, we don't have anything like that in, in, uh, you know, in, in the public arena. And I doubt we ever will. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're long past that point. We have social media. We have, we have television. We have, you know, all sorts of ways of communicating. So could we get alerts on our phone? Sure. Exactly. We already actually have te text alerts and things like that that come out to people who are, you know, who, who live their life with space weather. As a matter of fact, the, the community I have, uh, uh, if you don't mind me showing you something here, um, the community that I deal with that, that has kind of been a grassroots community, these people live space weather every day. And let me go ahead and put this big so you can see it. Um, all of these people kind of came out of the woodwork and they, they, they range from amateur radio operators uh, you can see here, and this includes uh, emergency responders. So these are the people that respond to hurricanes and earthquakes and everywhere you need to have emergency communications over the horizon where you don't have power anymore and you don't have cell phone infrastructure. All of this stuff, is, so this is the Red Cross, this is FEMA, this is international agencies. There's a whole host of, of people that work behind the scenes to try to keep people safe. And these guys are on the front lines of space weather. As a matter of fact, I'm an amateur radio operator now simply because I wanted to better understand their world so that I could help them do their job and know when these bad, these bad storms are coming um, because it's, it's critical to, to save lives. So yes, we have that for people like this. We also have for the GPS industry, and this includes the drone industry, the, emergence, the emerging drone uh, usage. Uh, GPS, for example, is incredibly susceptible to space weather and nobody seems to know it. 
it's and it's really here's another funny joke or not, not I want to call it a joke it's but it's a funny story I have a friend who's a satellite operator and uh, he lives in in Scotland and he's also he works for Airbus and in his spare time he flies drones and like a good engineer uh, he keeps all his telemetry from his drones he wants to be able to look at it and do forensics and everything and he came to me one day and he said um, you know was, was there a, a solar storm during this date and we went back and we looked it up and sure enough there was what we call a g2 level storm so it was a moderate storm and he said i thought so he said because when i flew my drone he said i was trying to get it to come down and land and right about this time and we, we pegged the time he said my drone started doing this and these arcs this fish bowling as we called it and this fish bowling was 50 feet wide and 30 feet high I mean, so this is a huge fishbowl in the sky, right? And he's like, it's on GPS mode. And he said, I, I, had a, I, I wanted to, to, to take it off, but I, he said, I decided not to. I decided to keep it on GPS mode because I wanted to see and fight it to the ground because I wanted the telemetry to find out what in the world was going on. Well, when we looked at the telemetry, it turned out that what was happening was that the signals he was getting from his GPS, you know, his receiver, they were what we call scintillating. Scintillating is what, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star. When you mm -hmm. look at stars in the sky and they blink and they twinkle, that's scintillation, which is beautiful when it comes to the night sky, but not really something you want your GPS to do. Mm -hmm. So he was having this problem. And what was happening is that his drone would lose the lock on the satellites that it had. And so it would find other satellites in the sky and it would lock on those and it would get a different position solution. So the drone would swing over here. But no sooner that it got the lock there that it would lose those satellites and catch these over here. And so it would reposition itself over here. And so it just kept doing this back and forth and back and forth. And he fought it all the way to the ground. And sure enough, there was aurora in his area, um, Northern Lights. That's a classic place for GPS scintillation to happen. And we've, we've known this as scientists for quite some time. And the sad thing was, was that he showed me he, uh, the the fact that the Amazon Air drone delivery harbor, their, their test drone facility, was located 30 miles from his house. And he showed me an article where the UK just that month had started um, allowing Amazon Air to drop packages in people's backyards uh, with this test. And these types of tests are ongoing all over the world. Right now there's, there's Canada is doing doing some very large helicopter-sized drones that they're delivering packages back and forth to. Australia has a, a drone test facility that they're delivering packages into people's backyards. These people have no earthly idea how much trouble they're in. No clue. Well, uh, I just wanted to ask about some more trouble, too, because uh, our chat room is asking about the Carrington event, like uh, Darsim, Stormer Joe, Heliopausing. Uh, pretty much, I think there's about 10 questions um, <laughs> involving the Carrington event and predicting it and how, you know, what, what would happen if it happened now, um, which I can only imagine would be very, very bad. Um, so, you know, just if you give us a little background about the event, um, and then also, sure. you know, what that would look like today and maybe what the chances are of that happening. So um, I'm trying to think, can I can I talk about this without let me let me talk. Hang on. But right before I go to the Carrington event, let me go to a slightly lighter shade of it. The Carrington event is what we call a super, super storm. But let me go to a, what just a super solar storm. So we have normal solar storms. We have, uh, we have super storms, and then we have the super, super storms. So you can imagine the, the cardinality of these. So let me talk about what a super solar storm can do. And you may not catch the total top here, but that's right. You can flip to the slide. So, so back in 1989, uh, and I've actually met somebody who went through this in Canada. It was pretty funny. He, he never knew what, what exactly happened because it never made the news uh, in terms of what the cause was. But there was this huge solar storm. This was a huge solar flare. Um, the solar flare, I think, was like an X-32. And, and that's an insanely intense uh, solar flare. And it also, at the same time, launched a solar storm. So 
uh, just like I said, this, this is what happens with space weather is that oftentimes you get these things in series and you get them almost all at once. And so it's not just one space weather event, it's a whole host of them. So when we got the solar flare, we, we lost com radio communications, we lost all sorts of, of ability to talk to things. And some of the events, for example, they say the Radio Free Europe, remember this is 1989, so Radio Free Europe was disrupted. They thought it was a Soviet jam event because we were still dealing with the Red Scare at the time. Um, and I have all of these types of things that, that happened, but they, some were caused, like this one were caused by the solar flare, but when the solar storm hit, which was later, we had weather satellites that lost images for hours. We had comsats that had more anomalies than you could shake a stick at. Um, the Tedris One was a military comsat, so it had it, it almost failed. I mean, it it, fa it it had anomalies, meaning that it it failed many times over. But they were able to resurrect it for for whatever reason, whether it was a calm issue or a single event upset, or there's all sorts of different types of anomalies we can have. The Space Sh Shuttle Discovery, its fuel sensor failed. I already talked about Radio Free Europe was disrupted. You can imagine amateur radio, of course, was completely wiped out. We didn't really have satellite phones at the time, so but I guarantee you satellite phones wouldn't be working either. Um, the when the solar storm hit, the Quebec, the Hydro Quebec power grid, it completely shut down. This is over um, Canada, and the James Bay network, which served over six million people, was offline for nine hours. This event was so intense uh, that it actually caused the Toronto stock market to close. And we had incredibly brilliant auroras all over the place. As a matter of fact, that black and white picture down at the bottom right shows a weather sat image. Now, this weather sat was designed to image weather during the day. And what, it's, what you're seeing there is that white bit, that is aurora. And the aurora is so bright, it saturated the sensor, completely Whoa. saturated it. People could read. Yes, people could read by the aurora. People could, um, the, the, we had birds that were chirping, thinking it was dawn. Farmers were milking their cows. This type of thing happens quite often. And we've got a lot of other superstorms in the space age that have caused total havoc. I mean, we've had cable satellites go down. Uh, we've had Halloween, what we call the Halloween events that caused uh, uh, a bunch of, of serious anomalies. Um, this is when astronauts have, have issues. They say when they close their eyes, it looks like the 4th of July because their, their eyes are being completely inundated by cosmic rays. And I could show you what that looks like on a sensor, but you know, I'm kind of jumping around. Anyway, th this is this, and, and here's the other thing is that if you look at, I'll move over to the side, these are um, transformers. And so if you look at the transformers, you can see how they've melted. This is because Big solar storms cause the Earth's magnetic field to shake, the, 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 the Earth's shield to shake and wiggle. And anybody who knows their Maxwell's equations knows that when you move a magnetic field, you can induce currents. And what it does is it induces currents in the ground uh, at various locations, especially where the bedrock is extremely conductive. And that happens over Canada, it happens over the East Coast quite a bit. And what ends up happening is that it induced that, it ends up inducing currents in the wires, in the power lines. And it overloads these transformers and blows them, melts them, literally melts them. And so that's really what we're worried about with the Carrington event. And now I'll go to the Carrington event so you can see um, what, the, what the effects were for the Carrington event. Because that right there was a superstorm. Now the Carrington event is far worse than a superstorm. If I can find it again, here's... So this is one of many slides I have on the Carrington event, but I think it's, it's telling. Oops, I hit the wrong one. Let's see. So with this one, you can see that there were sunpot, there were flare ribbons that, that uh, Carrington drew. Uh, he was one of several different scientists who actually drew the, the flare ribbons uh, on the sun. So he actually drew what was happening. It's one of the first times we were, the, that the flare was so bright. It was a white light flare that you could actually see the flare occur with your own eyes here on the ground. There's not a lot of flares uh, that, are, that you can actually see on the ground. Most of them we have to see in space because they don't occur in white light. Only the super powerful ones do. And believe it or not, that Carrington event in March, um, or excuse me, in, in September of 1859 was one of three events that occurred. Uh, we actually had multiple events um, during that year. But it was definitely the largest in 500 years. It was three times larger than the 80, 1989 event I just showed you. 
And what happened is that we had at the time, the infrastructure that we had was telegraph. And telegraph systems had unbroken lines, hundreds and hundreds of miles of unbroken lines. And because of that, that ground inducing the currents into the lines, just like power lines, they, because the lines were unbroken and there were no stops or breaks or anything, it allowed incredibly powerful currents and potentials to be built up in those lines. So, of course, these currents travel through the lines into the telegraph machines. And it was causing the telegraph machines to spark. And people would unplug the telegraph machines and the telegraph machines continued working, even though they were unplugged because they were getting current from the telegraph lines themselves. Wow. And it was overloading the systems and the, the sparks were catching the telegraph paper on fire and burning the operators and burning the oh rooms gosh. that the telegraph machines were in and they just couldn't stop it. So it was a really scary time for them. Um, and a, we had a roar down to Singapore. Uh, it, was, it basically met, was down at the equator. The aurora starts in the north and it starts in the south and it works down from the north and up from the south. And if it, the storm is big enough, it meets in the equator. It's kind of like we call it a polar cap. And if you imagine a cap that you put on your head, if it's a small storm, the cap only sits at the top of your head. And the, the more powerful the storm is, the further you pull the cap down over your head. Well, if you have a cap on the bottom and the cap on the top, then eventually they'll meet in the middle and the whole earth is engulfed in aurora because the whole, the, the Earth's magnetic shield is just rattling like nobody's business and it's trying to get rid of this energy. And so it's shooting it down its own magnetic field lines into the Earth's atmosphere and lighting, lighting it up like a beer sign. So yeah, they saw aurora in the Caribbean, in the Hawaii, in Singapore. If it occurred today, it would cause about two billion worth of damage. And you can see um, in that bottom grid, it says September 2nd, you can actually see the, the scale. This was when they were measuring a magnetic field on the ground. This, the, the field was so intense that it went off scale on their, on their uh, recorders. That, that line down there was actually overlapping a different reading from some other, um, you know, from a different reading from a different location. And it actually, um, it actually completely overwrote that because it was so intense. They had never seen anything like that before. So do these types of storms happen? Yes, they do. And when do they happen? Well, uh, let's see. I have, because um, people, one of the questions was, when can we predict them and when do they happen? Well, here's the scary bit. And I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the scary bit just for, for fun, <laughs> if you call it fun. <laughs> scary. <laughs> um, many of these extreme storms, like the Carrington event, occur actually not when the sun is super active and when it's going through really big activity cycles, but actually when we're having very small activity cycles. Hmm. And part of that is because we think the, the way the sun works is the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere get out of phase. Their, their magnetic fields get out of phase. And when they do that, they cancel each other a little bit, which means that the activity drops a little bit. Um, and so if you look at this top plot here, what you're looking at is sunspot number. You see it up, rising up on the vertical axis. And then you see time, uh, 1800, 1850, 1900, 1950, and 2000. And what you're looking at in that blue line is up, down, up, down, up, down. That's the solar cycle, right? We, have, we use sunspot number as a proxy for solar cycle activity. The higher the sunspot number, the more activity. The lower the sunspot number, the less activity. So you can imagine at the peak every 10 years or so, 11 years or so, you see the peak, that's the, the maximum. We call that solar maximum. You see the, the trough, that's solar minimum. And you can see all these activity cycles, right? But if you notice where some of the biggest storms occurred are at, at, at uh, in cycles that are less than average in terms of their strength. And believe it or not, we're right back out there now. We are actually going through a set of cycles that's very similar to what we saw uh, in the Dalton minimum. And that that is a period where we got one of the biggest storms we've ever seen. So, and we, and believe it or not, we actually had a Carrington event. We got, uh, we got clipped by a Carrington event and that was during a very scary time. And I'll show you one other thing, if you guys can handle the, this um, extended discussion. It's a very real situation. Um, this was back in 2017, and I called it a perfect storm, and you'll see why in just a second. 
So you can see the gentleman on the left. This was this was back in. You guys remember you, you remember Hurricane Harvey and, and Hurricane Irma? Mm -hmm. It was just a couple of years ago. Hurricane Harvey uh, had just decimated Texas. And you can see the poor gentleman on the, the left that was a seat taken right from CNN. This poor guy had been, um, it was his first hurricane and he had managed to get down to his dad's house. And he found, when he arrived, he found his dad's house was completely destroyed. And he had no cell phone. His cell phone had battery had run out a couple days prior. There was no power. There was no way to get communication in and out. And he was just absolutely terrified. Uh, luckily, he ran into a CNN reporter who let him use his satellite phone. Can you see the antenna? Um, and uh, and he got in touch with his dad and find out his family was okay. But while all that was happening at the beginning of September, us space weather people were looking at the sun because you see that big thing called it says 2673, that really kind of crazy looking colored region. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that region went from looking reasonably benign. And what we what we say by benign is when you see the blue and the red, if you have one blue and one red in, in that region, you're okay. What we're looking at here is a kind of a, a, a way of indicating what the magnetic field is doing, the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, I think blue is in to the, to the uh, it's, it's blue is moving one direction, um, pointing one direction and red is pointing the other direction. So they're opposites. What you don't want is to have magnetic field of opposite direction anywhere near each other. And you can see within two days, that region went from a simple red-blue to a red-blue, red-blue, red situation. And that is extremely dangerous. So us, us space weather people and solar physicists were looking at that region and just going, oh my God, this, this could give us a Carrington event. And we knew it was gonna be a bad actor. And sure enough, in one week, this region launched four X-class flares. And let me, let me give you a, just an idea of what, the, what the, the scales are. You see R, R levels, there's R levels, S levels, G levels. These levels only go to five. These are the space weather prediction levels uh, for different types of solar storms. And all of them only go to five. Five is the most extreme. And you can see in a single week that this one region, because it was so angry and so unstable, it fired four X-class flares at an R3 to R4 level blackout. Remember, the scales only go to five. It fired about 25 M-class flares from an R1 to an R2 level blackout. So these are communication blackouts, you basically ham radio, satellite phone, no types of communication uh, using radio waves was working. Uh, it also fired two solar radiation so storms at an S2 to S3 level and two geomagnetic storms at a G4 level. Uh, remember, the scales only go to five. And all of this happened in a single week. And where was Irma? Right there by Puerto Rico. It was decimating Puerto Rico. The Red Cross thought that um, the, their satellite phones weren't working because the hurricane was somehow affecting it. And amateur radio operators who were following me, they knew better because I, I was giving them uh, reports and telling them, no, we just have a really horrible player and you guys can't do anything right now. And it was just absolutely awful for them for that entire week because they couldn't get any messages in or out. Uh, I, and I even have movies. I won't, I won't bother showing them. But uh, it was just a horrible, horrible week. And so we really call that a perfect storm. When you lose your power grids, you lose your cell phones, you lose all that your satellite phone communication doesn't work. And now amateur radio doesn't work either. I mean, you have, you're basically, it's radio silent. And there was no way to help any of those people in these affected areas. And this kind of thing happens a lot. And this flare right here that you see, that flare, it fired when it shot, when it fired off, it was actually partially behind the sun's limb and it fired off a solar storm. But here's the interesting thing. It's like if I took a gun and I pointed it away from you and I shot, boom, imagine how big the bullet must be if it actually comes back and hits you. It's so wide, that bullet actually clips you. That's what happened. That was a Carrington event that it fired back on September 10th, and we actually got hit by it, even though it fired off this way, away from you. That's how big Carrington events are. But that's what we had. We, we've had, in this past cycle, we've had about three Carrington events. We've just been very lucky 
that none of them have hit us. So hopefully that answers the question. All right, now I'm completely terrified of the sun, I more know. so than I usually <laughs> was to begin with. There's um, no amount of so. SPF that can protect you from that. No, Ooh. not at all. No. So, <laughs> and uh, and of course, uh, our chat room's been saying this a lot too, uh, just to kind of remind folks, uh, don't go outside and look directly at the sun. Um, and uh, yes, even absolutely. eclipse glasses, just a reminder, eclipse glasses do have expiration dates, uh, so they don't last uh, quite long because that plastic material uh, will end up breaking down over time. Yes. So just a reminder, um, if you're even going to look with eclipse glasses, make sure that they're fresh ones, not ones that you might be old. Mm -hmm. so. Sitting in your back pocket for the past three years. Yeah. Might not be a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> probably not. Mm -hmm. so. Right. so, I mean, I think if there's one thing we can all agree on is um, how just kind of urgent or just kind of how impactful space weather can be. Um, and so you've done an amazing job kind of communicating that to us and to our audience, I'm sure, about how this is definitely something we should strive to understand, strive to pay attention to, because um, its implications are beyond, I think, what any of us could have imagined. So given that, um, what is kind of, to kind of wrap up the interview, what do you foresee being the future of your, um, your, just your entire space weather endeavor? Oh, and, and that's, you know, the, the, again, once again, it's this is the, the passionate part. Um, I, I know this. I mean, and I think a lot of your, your viewers know this, too. You see how the space weather reports kind of fit into the whole space news for, you know, format. And it seems pretty seamless. And, and as launches become more commonplace, as humans begin to work more in space, as, as space becomes far more, you know, our playground, we're going to realize that space weather is just part of weather. And ter terrestrial meteorologists are going to need to be trained in this. I mean, I, I can be the space weather woman, but I can't serve every locale on the planet. For, for example, the space weather in, in low latitudes, let's say in Brazil, I, it's so radically different than it is here in the United States, it's not even funny. Uh, spa uh, just the average citizen in Brazil knows that they could never get an Amazon air package delivered to them because during the summer, in the evening, at, during plasma bubble season after 9 p.m. at night, GPS just doesn't work, period. And nobody even bothers trying it. They think it's hilarious that people would even bother. So what we need is to have weather people who can talk about the local space weather for their community because it is just like terrestrial weather. And I think the, anal the, the precedent has been set how we've kind of grown with normal weather, how that, that field has progressed. We're going to see a lot of the same progressions in space weather, and I am actively leading, trying to lead that charge. I'm uh, I'm part of an ad hoc committee uh, for the American Meteorological Society. We are doing an exploration to see whether or not we can create a certification, uh, an AMS certification for space weather broadcasting, and 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 all, what we call a CBM. We can call it a CCM. That's for consulting meteorologists, but we're also trying to do one for broadcast meteorology. And that, you know, it's slow to begin with, um, but we're exploring that. Uh, I'm also working with uh, Millersville University. We are actually training uh, meteorologists right now, broadcast meteorologists in space weather, and we are actually creating a certification course or set of curriculum uh, with its own certification, you know, test that you can take afterwards to train these people to become space weather broadcasters so that we can start populating the planet with people who may first start being uh, what we call station scientists, but they can answer the mail. So you could actually call Ch CBS News, you know, your local channel 13 or something and say, hey, um, can you answer this question about the solar storm? And instead of getting static uh, on the line, you'll actually get someone who says, oh yeah, sure, let me tell you about it. And, and they'll actually be able to answer those questions. And then when space weather becomes an issue, as we will start seeing in the next couple of years, because right now the sun's very quiet, but because uh, we're at solar minimum. But as the activity ramps back up again, the picture changes dramatically. And I'm hoping that by sol next solar maximum, we will not only have space weather meteorologists in the field, but we'll start seeing space weather broadcasting uh, become a reality. And I'm I mean, I'm working with a ton of meteorologists. As a matter of fact, I'm being I'm, in, I'm invited to go speak at the broadcast conference uh, just in a few months uh, uh, re regarding this very thing. 
And we're, I've got tons of interest of people, of, of, meteor, of working meteorologists, not just here in the United States, but also in the, in the UK, who want to be trained as space weather broadcasters. So we're working on it. Just give us a little time. But that's going to be the future, and it's going to happen very soon. On the surface, it seems really complicated, like CMEs and all of this, you know, all of this stuff that's happening on the sun. It's a little intimidating. How do you make it more understandable for, you know, the average person? Oh, my gosh. This this has been a labor of love, I, I tell you. <laughs> um, the, the, honestly, I'll, I'll say that the honest way, I, I would love to take credit for it, but I can't. The, the credit comes from the community, and all I do is listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the community tells me, I get this, I don't get that. Explain this, because what you said just didn't work, and, and I need help understanding this. And so trying to meet that need, as a mm -hmm. matter of fact, that's, that's actually how the Space Weather One came online, was I, I, didn't, I never even got on social media for the reason of doing space weather. I got on it mainly for music and fun. And, and the, the perk was that I could answer questions about the sun and about space weather. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, the, the, questions, the more questions I'd answer, the more people would ask them. And it, it, be, it began to take over, really. Um, and then I began to ask the community, well, what do you want from me? What do you, what do you need to see? And because I came from an arena in which, you know, I speak jargon every day, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a, an, an ego or an issue about not speaking jargon to people. And what I wanted to do was be able to communicate the concepts. And so what I found really made the difference was when I just dropped the jargon mm -hmm. and I decided, to speak to everybody the way I spoke to people when I was in the studio. And they would ask me what I do, you know, on my day job. And I'd be telling musicians who had no skills in, in any of the science. They wanted to know what I, what I did, but they couldn't understand any of the language. So I kind of just developed very slowly a way of, of breaking the concepts down into the conceptual aspects. Mm -hmm. And I found very quickly that people grab the concepts easily. You know, most people are brilliant, to be honest. They don't realize they're brilliant. And they, they pay attention to all the noise that says, if you don't have a degree, you can't figure this out. If you aren't in school for this many years, then you're, you know, not worth anything intellectually. And I find that to be completely wrong. Um, most people are far brighter than they, than they give themselves credit for. And so I love proving that. Yeah. for people. And I, I absolutely love and respect that so much because um, one of my personal heroes, Carl Sagan, that was his biggest life's mission was to, you know, communicate, you know, science and particularly astronomy to people because at the end of the day, just like you had said, like, everybody is so much smarter than they think they are and that, you know, people who do have the advanced degrees may think they are. Um, so... Echoing that sentiment then, um, you mentioned that you were very passionate about um, promoting more women in STEM. Um, so can you kind of explain how you've oriented your career and some of your personal endeavors to promote more women in STEM or kind of how you pursue that? Ah, okay. So this, this, is, um, this is a very interesting topic because, you know, as, you, as you're, I'm sure, very well, well aware, there aren't that many women in, in science period. Um, you know, the, I mean, well, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. There are probably a lot of women in science, but not too many get the credit. Uh, women have, have such an uphill battle when it comes to, to not being marginalized, to actually having ideas that, that other people will listen to at the drop of a hat instead of being pushed aside and having to fight through, you know, a, a layer of jello just to be heard. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it, it causes a lot of issues. Um, women oftentimes are looked upon as being pushy, the ones that are successful. They're looked upon as being, you know, mean or, or man-like. <laughs> and it's a funny story. Um, if you just go to my YouTube channel and there are, I, not a lot, but there are definitely a few people, uh, men who will say, well, she's got, this, this woman obviously is a man. Look at her hands, look at the size of her hands. Look at her. Look at her. She's obviously a tranny. Oh, uh, they, they can't. They can't handle. Ugh. Oh yeah. 
<laughs> man hands. I mean, my husband even calls me man hands. I'm now. proud. I know I have man hands <laughs> too. I'm going to tell you, be proud of them because I, I, I play bass and you know what? My man hands serve me quite well in that arena. So you know what? Team man hands for the win. Sorry. Go yes, go. team man hands. <laughs> my husband loves, for the record, my, my husband, he loves my man hands. Ooh, take that internet. What? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, you know, it's it's one of the ways that Jared, poor Jared, he's sitting there going, oh, God, I, I really, I no, no, no. leave for a second. Can you we guys, take a bathroom break? I'm not sure. No, absolutely. No, you guys are on a topic that absolutely needs to be talked about and a topic that absolutely needs to be put at the forefront of what we're doing right now. Because this is, this is a point where the change has to happen. And if you don't want to come along with the change, that's fine. You can be a dinosaur and go extinct. So <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So. Well, the, well, the thing that the, the, the issue that I honestly have, and, and this, this is where it gets silly, is that in order for a woman to be smart, she has to be like a man. She can't be cool, cute, you know, even sexy, if I may use that word here. Um, she's not allowed to be any of that. So, you know, I'm supposed to tie my hair back and put glasses on. And, and you know, and that's the only way that people will actually even give me a chance to, to you know, give me any credibility at all to be actually intelligent. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair to, to anyone. Um, it, it's, not, it's, it's not fair to, to women who, who you know, naturally wear themselves that way, and it's not fair to women who don't, because it means that in or, you know, women then have to choose between being sexy and pretty and, and you know, the classic definition of what a woman should be, or women who want to be smart but then completely asexual and that's i think that's wrong you know that's it's just a, a, a pigeonhole that we shouldn't have to push women into and i think to a great degree that's part of what leaves what causes some women to leave the field um you know there's, that there's this cultural barrier that nobody even talks about or even sees to a great degree because it's so ingrained in us and it's not just ingrained in men this isn't just a male problem women are ingrained this way too we've all been socialized this way and, and that's, you know, going back to astrosociology, that's another reason why I love astrosociology is because it kind of breaks those barriers and, and allows us to, to find a new cultural norm. And I'm hoping that, that women who are pushing the boundaries of space and are pushing the boundaries of science, but yet will still, you know, be themselves and dress the way they want to and be feminine and things like that, that the more people that get out there like that, the more it becomes the cultural norm. And, and then it's okay to say, wow, she's, she's pretty and she's smart, you know, and, and that's not considered a, a, some, some strange juxtaposition of mm -hmm. things that should never go together. You know, but right now it's an oxymoron. It, it really is. And, and yeah, that, so I push, I, I try to help women uh, who are in science to, to allow themselves to be who they are and show their personalities more. And that, believe it or not, is, is a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I even want to say just as somebody who's not like heteronormative, you know, that's, uh, that's something that we have to deal with as well uh, in that aspect as well. There's sort of this idea that you have to just you know, keep to yourself and everything like that and stay quiet with it. But it's really one of those things that's, uh, that we're trying to kind of break out for everybody to be able to bring that to the table. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah great stuff. Mm -hmm. I love that. No, I absolutely love that. And that, that's and that's where we should be going. I mean, if we want to break out of this and, and if we want to be able to transcend our old, the old mores and the old ideals, we really need to go those directions and we need to embrace it. And and so, you know, I I, I, I laugh because I actually have a couple, um, you know, really harsh examples of, of how I've had to fight that on my on during my journey. Um, you know, I almost I almost. Uh, well, I can talk about it now because the gentleman who who worked at my at my company he's he's moved on he's he left the company and and he's no longer with them. But he actually tried to get me fired. He actually created a, a false security investigation because I was doing space weather woman videos on my own time, and he didn't like that. He didn't like what I was doing. He didn't like that that he didn't think that women should be doing this kind of thing. And and he har he had been harassing me for a very long time, and he was one of my bosses. And, you know, I ended up having to change departments just to be able to continue doing something in my own spare time without being harassed by a boss who was basically telling me that uh, he was going to get me fired. It, you know, these, these types of things shouldn't be happening. So, you know, 
it's as long as we continue fighting the good fight and as long as we continue showing examples to the contrary, I think we're I think we're all moving in the right direction. It may be at a snail's pace, but it's still in the right direction. Excellent. Beautiful. Yeah. OK, so for our viewers out there, then uh, where can we keep up to date with all of this? Oh, goodness. Um, well, spaceweatherwoman.com is a great one. Uh, that's my that's my website. And then um, you if you want to get in touch with me very easily and quickly, Twitter is a great way to do it. So I'm Tam of the Scove on Twitter. Um, and uh, obviously on YouTube, you can get a hold of me as well. So it's it's reasonably easy to get a hold of me uh, because uh, I you know I work in academia as well as as here on on you know on social media. So please, I, I definitely welcome anything and everything when it comes to suggestions on how to make it better, how to make it more uh, actionable, all of that stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this really deep dive conversation. Um, I'm, I'm sure I speak for everybody when we all learned so much. And yes, it's mm -hmm. a little scary, but you know what? Knowledge is power. We can band together, make space weather mainstream so that we can prepare ourselves for these scary yes. events. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Scove. Um, we definitely look forward to seeing more of your space weather reports in the future. And um, make sure, oh, actually, before we close out, mm -hmm. I I actually want to give a big thank you to the people who even make this show possible. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, I'm speaking to you, Escape Velocity Citizens. Uh, these fantastic folks do contribute. How much do they contribute per show, Jared? They give us $10 or more per episode. That, Holy moly. That is amazing. All right. And then, of course, we also want to give a big old hug to our orbital citizens. How much do they contribute, Jared? Five dollars or more per episode. Whoa. Whoa. Wow. And that, you know what? It doesn't stop there. Because not only do we have our orbital citizens, we also have our, you guessed it, suborbital sub citizens. citizens. And these folks, they contribute. Two dollars and fifty cents or more per episode. Which makes sense, considering how much they say it flies on a Virgin Galactic spaceship, too. Oh, wow. 250, 250 suborbital. You know Basically the same thing. You know just got to add a few zeros, so, move yeah, the decimal exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I believe we also have another entire army of folks supporting us called Ground Support. Mm -hmm. These folks contribute a dollar That's per right. episode. That's right. <laughs> I get my name up there for a dollar. I mean, I think it's worth it. I mean, yeah. I'd love my name up there. That would be great. Um, so again, thank you to all of our citizens and all of our viewers. And if you don't contribute per month, you can still help us out by subscribing, sharing, liking, telling all of your closest friends about us, having us play in the background at your next family dinner. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Definitely join us next Saturday at 20.30. UTC. 1800. 1800. I think you mean 1800. <laughs> Why don't you guys stop it? Because it's not science. So right. it's space um, today. <laughs> and we will be here waiting for you to watch us. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.